the music. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. My name is Gary Holmes. I serve along with Andrew Jones as pastors here <clears throat> at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. And it is a blessing to welcome you to the final service on Christmas Eve to celebrate the blessings of God's grace revealed in Christ for our lives. And we've been going through a series of looking at how does a weary world rejoice. And so tonight we continue that to find the joy and the grace that moves into our souls and to our people, and to our nation, that God would be honored and people blessed. So thank you for being with us, and I pray the Spirit of God be upon you as we worship. And wherever you are, God has made room for you here. God bless you. Merry Christmas.
call to worship. We count it in mere hours now. Soon the first pains of labor will be felt. Soon the light will shine in the darkness. Soon the baby will be born. Soon God will once again break into our lives, coming in a way that is expected yet unusual. God of birth, God of light, in this time of worship, reawaken us the awe of Christmas. As we hear again the story of a young woman and a surprising visitor, remind us that we are called to respond to you in unexpected ways. And when we leave this place, may we be willing to sing praises. in royal David city stood a lowly cattle shed where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his bed Mary was that mother mild Jesus Christ her little child. Scripture lesson is from Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 and 6 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this.
This next scripture lesson is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quinarius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child.
third reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. The next scripture reading is from Luke 2, verses 8 through 14. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors.
angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. Thank you, choir. Now is the time we come to our service. We celebrate God's gracious gifts to us by sharing a proportion of our income with our tithes and our offerings, that God would be honored, people would be blessed, we can reflect the generosity of God in our hearts today. Now we call ashes to wait upon us. Show. 
And so these gifts that we received, we ask God to use them to reach those in need to help them feel welcome. So, to the glory of God, for the sake of the world. Amen. Is there- 
Satan's life For in his hands he holds tomorrow Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart For God to rise? There is Room, a poem by Reverend Sarah R. Speed. The world may feel like one long stretch of night, like an endless winter or a hovering rain cloud. And life may feel like walking into the wind, an uphill climb in every direction. But we can still open the door. We can't calm every storm, but we can turn on the porch lights. We can add chairs to the table. We can keep clean sheets on the guest bed, just in case. We can hold the elevator and learn pronouns. We can tell stories of belonging and take turns listening. We can learn each other's names and plant trees for our children. We can study privilege and advocate for mental health. We can insist every single day in a million different ways, there is room. There is room. There is room for you here. We can't calm every storm, but we can turn on the porch lights. So Advent has been a series of preparing by asking the question, how does a weary world rejoice? And we started by asking the question, well, the only way to begin to move into the solutions for this is to be mindful of how God is at work in our midst and to recognize that, you know what? We are weary. <laughs> we talked about, so, uh, talked about this in staff about whether or not <clears throat> we want an Advent to have this kind of bent towards weariness when we want joy and celebration. And, and I guess what this series kind of challenges us to think about is that joy isn't an opposition necessary to our weariness, but it does dance with it and allow hope and light to find its way. So we acknowledge our weariness. We start out by looking at Zechariah. He was this high priest who's in the Holy of Holies, the sacred time of the year, and he's performing his sacred duties, and all of a sudden something happened he didn't expect. God showed up. Isn't that interesting? I mean, he's in the Holy of Holies. This is the place, the sacred spot, and he's going through the motions. He didn't expect God to show up. Maybe it's because he experienced so many challenges in his life. Maybe he had unanswered prayer and he spent his life asking God for a child that he and Elizabeth could have a child. And some of us know that pain, that hurt. And sometimes that leaves us without recognizing that in the midst of that, we're unaware of the possibilities. But when we become aware of our weaknesses, when we come, or when we become aware of our weariness, then maybe the possibilities that we can 
see a light of hope to pierce through. And all of a sudden, we have the story. The preparation of Elizabeth to give birth to John the Baptist, and their preparations to soon the story of Mary. But in all things, we acknowledge our weariness. So it's okay, even on Christmas Eve, to acknowledge the weariness. We're about to deal with a story that centers on Bethlehem, which in this current moment is surrounded by an army. There is weariness in the world, in our personal lives. Maybe we celebrate this holiday. Missing someone. But the weariness can't stop us from the possibility of dancing with what can happen. And the joy finds its way into the connections. And as some of you know, I lost my father only a few weeks ago. And I start getting all this affirmation, all these people generating love and support and care and sharing stories of their own struggle. And all of a sudden, in the midst of those connections, joy found its way. And we started sharing stories of joy and, and memories of happiness and peace. Connectedness is so important. And it's such an important part of our acknowledging our weakness and allowing joy to come into our lives. And when we find those connections, then we remember that we can be amazed. I mean, we see it in our children or our grandchildren in this season, the amazement, the excitement, the joy that just, they're ready for it. They haven't learned like us adults to become cynical and, and preoccupied and uninterested. <laughs> I share the story of my grandchildren, and uh, two of them were here at the 4 o'clock service just watching them, but I, every time I think of when Oliver would, with that smile of his, and he's so inquisitive at, at one, he would then point, and, and he was just amazed by what he was looking at, and, and I just thought, yeah, Oliver, that's an amazing ceiling fan. <laughs> the, all the possibilities we prepare ourselves for what might happen. We become amazed because amazement has that balm for weariness. It, it awakens us to overcome the numbness maybe we feel. It makes us aware of the possibilities. The surprises can turn to joy because amazement is a precursor to that joy. How does a weary world rejoice? Then today, uh, Pastor Andrew walked us through how we can sing stories of hope. Hope that according to Mary, even in the midst of the discomfort, this young teenager who's nine months present, pregnant, it was walking nine or ten days to get to Bethlehem because of the census. Desert and mountain. I can't imagine. But somehow, even in the midst of this, she cherished all the things that had happened. Because the stories of hope, the promise that something God was doing was enough to guide her and offer her a blessing. Luke's story, the gospel, gives us the story of Jesus. And as we know, they finally did get to Bethlehem. That would be the place. The, interesting enough, the, uh, it was a town, the bread was made. And here the bread of life was giving birth, being birthed in this setting. And we know the story that they came there. There's not a lot of understanding about is it an inn, some kind of Motel 6 going on here, or what might be there? But what we find is some scholars believe that the reference is more to like a garage of the time where the animals would be kept. There'd be a main room, there'd be a sleeping quarters, and there, there'd be uh, this place where the animals were with the manger. And because Mary was coming there in the culture of the time, because she's about to give birth, blood was involved and so was considered unclean. And they separated and maybe Joseph and Mary felt this was the best way to go. The census brought all of his family. They were at his house probably, and it was busy and lots of people, and there wasn't room. Not in the guest room. So they ended up in the straw, isolated. Maybe that felt some comfort of being away from the others. And then we get the story of the birth of Christ. God with us, being laid in an eating trough. We wouldn't even know the term manger if not for this story, likely. There wasn't room. But this is the amazing beauty of this story. There's a story of a boy who wanted to be Joseph in the pageant. 
And because he didn't get it, he was frustrated and a little upset, and he ended up being the innkeeper. And so when the time and the story came, he was standing at the door, and Mary and Joseph come, and they said, do you have room? And everybody in the congregation was waiting for, there's no room in the inn. He took a little privilege. Hey, I'm in a great room. Come on inside. I'll lend it to you. And right, started to laugh and joke about it, and it made the rest of the story a little awkward. Now what do we do with this? His parents, when they got home, talked to him about it, and he said, well, quite honestly, I know that God can be anywhere, and I don't want to be the one to say there's no room. So I invited him in. Tonight we talk about how a weary world rejoices. It recognizes how we can make room for the divine, for the amazing, the awe-inspiring, the blessing of others to encourage and be with us. Opportunities for great laughter, great connections with the divine. How do we make room? The story's amazing because we often focus in, do we make room for Christ, which is a good question to ask. Do we make the space? Do we allow for the divine to have a word into our lives or will we become so unamazed with life that we discard the possibility. The story is about how God, in fact, makes room. We have the story of the shepherds. Now, what do we know about the shepherds? They were the first to receive from the messenger. Now, it could be that they were flying angels and flopping around and everything from heavenly hosts, but that term messenger often reflected just simply a person who is communicating God's message to the people. We don't know understand the divine nature. There is references to re, re, returning to the heavenly host, but the reality is that the word messenger is later used the same way for the shepherds who received the message became messengers of it. The shepherds play this important role, the first to go to see the child. What do we know about shepherds? They were pretty low on the social economic ladder, maybe the lowest. I mean, come on, let's face it. What did they smell like, right? What was their income? They're probably uneducated. And yet, these are the ones that God makes a part of the most amazing story for humanity. God makes room for even shepherds. Now, in fact, this God that we claim to understand reflects the nature of God's character by reaching out to these shepherds to be agents of going to see the king. And they were filled with joy over it. And then this child grows up and says, I'm a good shepherd. And refers to the people, the sheep that he cares for. The image becomes then a sign of how the divine works in humanity. The story makes room for the shepherds. That's the kind of God we serve. I want to, if you don't mind, can we slip into Epiphany just for a moment? I won't stay there long. But then we have the story out of Matthew, the story of the three magi. We refer to the three kings. Why? Why do we refer to them as three kings? Because of a Christmas hymn. We three kings of Orient. It's the only place it's said, right? We understand more about the phrase to me, more having to do with astrology or magi, studying the stars. What we find is that these, we don't know how many, Yes, there's gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but that doesn't mean how many people there are. Go to your house. How many gifts? If there's three gifts, are there three of you, or are there 40 gifts? And two of you, who knows, but right? But this story tells us that the Magi come from the east, Persian probably, and very likely they come from religious sect centered in Iran, modern day. And God uses them. We go from the lowly shepherds and to those who can present gifts of gold and incense, of frankincense and myrrh, symbolizing wealth, symbolizing a faith beyond the Jewish faith. Why would God choose to reach out to them? Because we serve a God who makes room for others. I think as a church we struggle with that, don't we? We're afraid that if we make room for people who think or act or believe differently than us, then God somehow will be diminished or hurt or maybe we get uncomfortable. This story tells us we have to learn to be who God calls us to be amidst diversity, amidst people who are different than us. 
to make room for them because that's the message of this season. We don't have to lose our faith. We don't have to neglect our story. But maybe we can listen more. Maybe we can engage others different than us. And maybe there's opportunities to see them and to relate to why our lives are changed by this story. The God who humbly comes to a peasant family, to an infant laid in an eating trough in Bethlehem. How do we make room for our lives in in order that God might continue to be manifested in meaningful ways in the context of a challenge weariness just seems to constantly be surrounding us? So as we prepare in a moment to share the light, I want just to encourage you to consider, God, how can this story open me up to the possibilities of, one, seeing joy seep into our weariness, that I might be able to understand the depth of your love and care for those around you and inviting those who might be considered outside of acceptance, and yet you make them the center of the story? May we do the same. And as we share the light, Maybe we reminded that as the light is shared, the darkness is pushed back. The weariness has less impact. We can be a people that honors God and blesses those around us, even in our diversity. I'm so grateful to serve a God who has the willingness to demonstrate in a central story of our tenet of our faith that includes those we normally would include. May it be true in us as well. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for a story that challenges us. Sometimes we get into just a normal understanding of what it means, and then it just seems like you speak to us about how we can be more who you call us to be, that we can reflect your image, that Christ came for all. The faith was to reach all the world, that grace and mercy was available to all. Help us be messengers, agents. Help us open and make room for those around us that we can dialogue in the faith of love. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And so we're about to enter a new season in life of the church in the new year, and exciting things are happening. So we'd like to share this video with you. And I apologize. Andrew and I went out um, to the lighthouse by Summerfest, and it was windy. So... Don't expect a great presentation, but I hope you can understand it well enough to get the gist. Lighthouse is not the coast of Lake Michigan. They're structures with a long tradition of insurance safety and offering guidance to boats that enter their harbor. In the same way, Jesus is a light. This week we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Jesus, and the spring we'll start looking, of course, at Holy Week and Easter, the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's so important for us to stand the life of Jesus in between. The remarkable life of Jesus guides us in how we relate to God and love one another. During Lent, we will look at an extraordinary life that connects us to God, nurtures us to grow, and challenges us to serve. We think that it is a life worth imitating. This Lent, we want to invite you to begin a spiritual journey of discovery. We will look at the light of Jesus to guide us to live with purpose in our one and the only life. To prepare for this journey, we'll be taking time in January to look at what it means to live uh, a year living well. It's an examination of what Jesus meant, that your faith has made you well. And he reminds us to love with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And in February, we're launching small groups because we don't want anyone to take this journey alone. We are living a shared life of faith. Okay, we probably could have just skipped that whole thing, but the intent was <laughs> the intent was to share that we're excited about spiritual pathways, helping us connect and grow and serve in our relationship with God and each other, and that um, we're starting the new year with a series called uh, Life Worth Living Well. So I hope you might consider being a part of that. And again, it's so grateful to have you here tonight. Those who are here or online, we celebrate God's grace that's revealed in your life.
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In the Gospel of John, we have the story of light. That's the story of the beginning of this Gospel, the light that comes. So we're going to invite you to receive now the light. The ushers will share the light with you. Just be aware of the fact that if your candle's lit, do not turn it. Keep it up straight, and the person who's not lit can turn it to receive. And may we be aware of how the light pierces the darkness, and as we share it, we see the light of the world bringing hope. I invite you to stand as you're able.
Now we are bearers of the light. We become messengers. And I pray we can make room. What might God do in our lives, in our communities, in our church, in our world, if we make room for the light of redemptive and healing hope and love? Carry the light in your heart and your spirit as you go forth. May the peace and love of Christ dwell in you richly. I invite you to distinguish the physical light. Just be mindful that blowing hard might leave marks on the person in front of you. Um, So we want to make room for something other than wax. May we extinguish our light to experience the joy. Pray the Spirit be upon you. As you go from this place, let the light of love in Christ dwell in you. May the power of the Spirit enable you to open your lives to make room for those in need that surround you. Go in the peace of Christ. Merry Christmas.